Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Times Talks 20th Anniversary Festival. I'm Michelle Gray, the creative director of the New York Times live conversation performance and screening series, Times Talks. For 20 years, Times Talks has showcased world-class journalists and creative thought leaders who have used the arts, sciences, and public office as a lens for change and a platform for conversation. There's more in store following today's Times Talks. I encourage all of you to visit our exciting activations, specifically the Smorgasbord Food Hall downstairs. Now down to business, I'm delighted to welcome you to today's event with an extraordinary group of United States Senators. Susan Collins, the Republican of Maine, Amy Klobuchar, Democrat of Minnesota, and Heidi Heitkamp, Democrat of North Dakota. Unfortunately, Iowa has been struck with an April snowstorm, and Jody Ernst, I know, is en route from LaGuardia, so we're really hoping that she can join the tail end of the conversation. So I guess we're in the hands of the traffic between LaGuardia and Time Center, so fingers crossed that she can make it. Uh, rarely together in one group outside of Washington, these incredible women are here to discuss women in politics, public policy, and the special relationships cultivated amongst women of the upper chamber. Moderating today's conversation is former New York Times congressional reporter, Jennifer Steinhauer, who has been with the Times for over 20 years and has more recently become the live editor of Times Talks, focusing on politics, current events, and the Trump administration. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Jennifer Steinhauer, Susan Collins, Amy Klobuchar, and Heidi Heitkamp. Welcome to New York Times subscribers. It's great to see you here. Thank you for what you do to help our journalism happen. This is pretty great. This is kind of, this is the opposite of a mantle. Do you guys know what a mantle is? <laughs> you know, you turn on the cable station and you're looking at a panel and it's all men. You're like, hmm, this is the anti-mantle right here. So um, just a little bit and how this is going to work. We're going to visit as a group for um, a little while and then we will open up toward the end to questions from all of you and from our Facebook Live audience. And hopefully Senator Ernst will be able to join us by then. I want to throw out some questions for all of you to answer, and then I'll do some things individually as well. So one thing I'm really interested in is how few female senators there have been historically. And you're still less than 25% of the body. And, and Congress generally is so much fewer uh, women than other institutions, other organizations, and in business, in the corporate world. It's, you're just underrepresented. And I'm curious what you all think about what the impediment is to running generally, specifically statewide, specifically for the Senate, and talk a little bit about how you were able to overcome those and set your mind to running. Um, why don't we start with you, Senator Collins? Well, I was very fortunate because uh, I come from the great state of Maine, and the entire time, <laughs> there's some Mainers out there, <laughs> the entire time when I was growing up, Margaret Chase Smith was serving in the Senate. So we had a great role model already. And I believe that she paved the way for Olympia Snow and for myself to be elected. And there weren't questions about whether a woman could serve. Now, I will tell you that I'm often called upon to call women who are thinking of running for office. And what I would find it's a lot of times we lack confidence in ourselves. And that women will say to me, well, I think I'm not quite ready. I need to take one more course or hold one more position. And I will tell you, I'm also called upon to recruit men to run for office. I have never, <laughs> ever had a man say that to me, that he wasn't quite ready. There may be other reasons that he doesn't run. But so I think there's a self-doubt and a hesitancy to take risks that we women need to overcome. Interesting. I, I, 
I, I completely agree with Susan. Anyone who's tried to recruit women always says, well, I don't know that I really am qualified for that job. And I always say, have you met the North Dakota legislature? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and, and so I, I just, um, for, for me, I think that one of the impediments that we're seeing now is that this is a blood sport. This has gotten so tough, and it's, it's gotten so ugly and so contentious and so confrontational and, and a lot of name calling. And, and women will say, it's just not worth it. I've got other things I can do with my time. The other thing I think that is, is difficult is the self-selecting very young. Um, I tell this story, and it's a story about when I ran for governor. My opponent had children that were exactly the same age as mine, and they were young. They were 10 and 14. And people would ask me, you know, how old are your children? And I'd say, well, they're 10 and 14. And then they'd go, how old are your children? And, and the message was clear, in which case I would say they're the same age as my opponent's children. And it, was, it would kind of shock them because what they would ask me about that life balance is not what they would ask a male. And I think a lot of women, that, that reflects an internal uh, uh, conflict that we all have about what is our role as young people. And so women tend to come to politics older. And I think that delays you know, kind of the, the pipeline of people who are available for jobs like the United States Senate. And so I think you have to look at what those challenges are very young in their life. You have to look at what self-doubts that she's talking about, but you also have to look at kind of this, this um, bias that women feel or that people feel outside of that about um, what our role is when we're young mothers. Um, my state, I was the first woman elected to the Senate, and we had two really qualified women run in each decade before that, um, and they didn't make it. And a lot of their focus was on running as a woman and being the first woman there. So I went out of my way, because I kept getting asked, can a woman win? This is in 2006. Um, and so I went out of my way to say, in crowds, and when I look back on it, it makes no sense at all, but I would say, um, you know, I'm not running as I'm proud to be a woman candidate, but that's not uh, the theme of my campaign. I'm running on my record as a prosecutor. And the last time I looked, half the voters were men. And so if I was just running as a woman, I wouldn't win. <laughs> and the men would all go, mm-hmm. <laughs> to, to this day, I actually don't think it makes much sense. Um, but I was shocked. I was shocked at the things I would have to do to kind of show that that wasn't my theme. I was running on my own strength. Um, and I thought it was a very important part of this. The other piece, I agree with everything that Heidi and Susan said, but the other piece of this was raising money. It's gotten easier now for women, but it was harder back then because they thought you couldn't win, so that just added to it. Um, and I remember in my uh, race for Senate that first time, I tried to call everyone and people wouldn't call me back across the country. I'd never raised more than $100 in my county attorney race. That was the maximum you could get in off elections and 500 in the election year. And finally, one August, when no one was returning my call, I just went and got all my contact lists and every address book I could phone. This is a true story. I called every single person I ever knew in my life. And that was when I set what is still an all-time Senate record. I raised $17,000 from ex-boyfriends. <laughs> um, and, and as my, as my <laughs> husband has pointed out, it's not an expanding base. <laughs> so, you know, you just, I, I would say the moral of our stories is that you cope, you get around it somehow uh, so you can meet your goals and go there with the mission, and then you can do it. I can't tell what that was like to get rid of you or to support <laughs> you. There's like so many ways to interpret that. So then, so you get it, you win, you, you're here. I have a very um, strong memory of talking to former uh, Senator Kelly Ayotte about her first day in the Senate when she kind of walked into the chamber and she couldn't believe she was there. And a security guard said to her, I'm sorry, ma'am, this is for senators only. <laughs> um, and this is not long ago. That was 2011. I think she won in 10. So I'm curious, um, you arrive in this you know, pretty male bastion still in the United States Senate. Did you have a Kelly at moment like that? I mean, did you have these moments where you became just incredibly, um, either subtly or directly in that way, aware, well, I'm a woman in the Senate, this is a, a rare deal? 
I can yeah, tell Sarah Klobuchar you've got something no, to share. Well, I was on uh, I was on an elevator with actually a young staff person. I'll say who it is because you know who it is. It's Jake Sullivan who went on to be Hillary's person. And we're on this elevator, and I will not say the senator. He's no longer there. And we're in the senator's only elevator, and the door opens. And I've been in the Senate now for three months. There's only 100 of us. And the senator looks at me and says, excuse me, to Jake, and he looks young, Jake does, and me. This is a senator's only elevator. <laughs> and I remember I looked at him, and he, I said, and who are you? I am a senator. And I know exactly who he was. I go, I don't know who you are, but I'm a senator. And then the door closed. Anyway, <laughs> so I, you know, I think everyone has those. And it's, it was weird for me because I went from being this county attorney where it's kind of a male job, a lot of males in law enforcement, but half my office was women. And I um, just had not experienced it as much. This is what was weird in that job because I think the courthouse was filled with women and women judges until I got to Washington. And it felt like I was back at the beginning of my time in the law firm when everyone was wearing bow ties. And you know, you were told you had a smile in the hallway. So it just felt like we were going back in time and maybe it's because it was at a bigger power moment, but that's what it was like. Well, I, I, I um, had been there a couple months and I had some family members who were coming in in order to get on the train, they either have to badge up and turn in their electronics to get over to the um, Capitol, or you have to check them in. And I didn't know if I just said, hey, they're with me, that they could get on the train. So I was, went to the counter, and um, he said, you can't, you, can't, you can't bring them in. I need your ID. And I said, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. And I reached in my pocket for whatever reason. I had my ID with me. And he goes, so you're a Senate spouse? <laughs> And it was, that was the moment. I was pretty tolerant up to that moment. And I went, no, I am the United States Senator from my state. And, and though they laugh about it now, the, these guys. And I think, I think part of it, you, you have to not overreact to that because I think it's really important that we all have images. You know, when, when you hear for the first time, the doctor, she came in, you kind of, oh, yeah, yeah. That's, or the nurse, he helped me. I mean, we all have bias, we all have gender bias. And I think that, that the more of us who show up, the, the more image people will have that is gender neutral of who a United States Senator is and the more it'll change. But I think when you're one of um, 15, I, I don't know how many were there when Amy got there, when I was part of the record number, one out of 20, and um, Susan was one way back in, in the early days where it was one out of four? Nine. So nine. So, so it's, change, it's changing. What I've found is that to this day, there still is a barrier that women who are elected to the Senate have to surmount. And that is when a man is elected to the Senate, it's assumed that he belongs there. With a woman, you have to prove that you belong there. Now, once you go through that process, then you're fine. You're accepted as a member of the club, if you will. But there is still that extra barrier that women senators face. Um, it, my moment was more of a substantive moment. I had been in the Senate for quite a while. I'd worked on a lot of important bills. But after 9-11, along with Joe Lieberman, I was responsible for overhauling our intelligence agencies. And we put this enormous bill on the Senate floor. And it was a bill where there were a lot of different powerful male chairmen had equities in it. And the Department of Defense, headed by Donald Rumsfeld at the time, did not like the bill that we were creating. So I mean, there's several memories from that time. One was having Donald Rumsfeld testifying before me when I was chairman of the Homeland Security Committee. And I looked out, and all of a sudden, for the first time, I realized that I was the only woman on the panel. I'd never really given it thought before. And I also looked out, and here we had Donald Rumsfeld and all the brass from the Pentagon in a panel before me, all male. And then I thought, it doesn't matter. I'm in charge. <laughs> <laughs> it 
it was a great feeling. <laughs> it really was. Um, so let's talk about some of the ways, um, small and large, that um, women have impacted the Senate as an institution, both even sort of physically, right, in some ways we can get into, and substantively, we, we always, I've written this story myself 20 times, women many times solve problems better than men in the Senate, Then they get together um, on bills in certain ways. But let's truth squad that a little bit. Is that more mythology, or do you think that there truly is more comedy, more bipartisanship, and more um, substantive legislative movement when you all work together in specific things? Okay, well, uh, yes. there is a Harvard, <laughs> yes, yes. yes. Uh, there's actually a Harvard study that proves it. It's not just our anecdotes. They looked at the male senators, the women senators, and they found that the women senators worked across the aisle better, that we passed more bills, that we got more things done. Um, of course, we're small but mighty in our numbers. And uh, when I think of it now, we have eight uh, ranking or chairs of committees that are women in the Senate. Uh, the women have been involved in a lot of the really important bipartisan efforts. And part of it is when you're in a minority like that, you tend to try to find common ground. We get together, we have those secret dinners. Of course, we never talk about the male senators. Um, <laughs> And I think one of the best examples of this was um, when Susan actually, um, and we've all been involved in bipartisan groups, including recently, the three of us um, were about 15, 20 people um, on the uh, Dreamers. But when I go back in time when Ted Cruz caused a shutdown, do you remember that? Uh, which will go to my lowest moment, except when we had the fiscal cliff vote and it was midnight on New Year's Eve and I was on the Senate floor and the whole tax system of the country is hanging in abeyance. Uh, and there we are, that magical moment, midnight on New Year's Eve. I look to my left, I see Harry Reid. I look to my right, I see Mitch McConnell. Every girl's dream on New Year's <laughs> Eve. But when, but when Ted Cruz actually shut the government down, it was Susan that gave a speech um, on a weekend about how we needed to do something and come together. And I remember I was the first Democrat that called her, and then Lisa and Kelly and others, and she started this Common Sense Caucus, and we got together and we came up with a plan and we brought it to the leaders and we said we have the press gallery reserved and 14 of us are going to, with this plan if you don't get something done in the next few hours. And we went to both leaders and said this, and we got it done. Um, and that is just one example and the government reopened. But time and time again, I've seen the women because of their ability, the trust that we have with each other, we're not necessarily the same philosophically, but the trust that we have with each other that we are better able to forge compromises. You know, that was so interesting because it was in 2013, it was a Saturday, I was in the office all alone because my staff had been furloughed and uh, I flipped on my computer and tapped out at some points because I was watching the Senate floor on C-SPAN and I could see a Democratic senator coming to the floor and pointing fingers to the other side. A Republican senator would speak next, do the exact same thing, and nobody was offering a solution and it just drove me crazy. And so I went to the floor and uh, without having vetted my speech with anybody, <laughs> making my staff very nervous, I'm sure, but I went to the floor and I outlined a three-point plan for how we could reopen government. And I do think it's significant that the moment I got off the floor, my cell phone started ringing and it was all women senators who called me first and said, we agree we want to join with you, how can I help? And from that, and we did have some good men join us along the way, I, I hasten to say, but the first calls were all from my women colleagues. And we formed the Common Sense Coalition and we did come up with the plan. And then we reprised it this year when we had the brief shutdown. And Heidi gave me this famous talking stick that I used to control the debate. Yeah, and let, and, until someone threw <laughs> it. No, okay. and, uh, it. But I do think that although it's dangerous to generalize because there are women 
um, senators who are less collaborative, and there's some male senators who are very collaborative, that in general I've found that women are more problem solving in their orientation and more collaborative. I, I think when you look at it, women don't like wasting time. I mean, we're, we're multitaskers, and when you see something happen, you kind of wait around for somebody else to step up, which was the 13 story. Um, when we did it this next time, Susan engaged immediately. Um, because one of the things that, that we don't tolerate is because we're all busy and we have a whole lot of pieces of our lives that you have to put together, I don't think we like wasting our time. And when you do things that are simply a time suck and a waste of time to no purpose and no end, I think you will always see women saying, that's not working for me. I'm going to step in. I'm going to try and fix that. And, you know, one of the things probably being one of the most moderate along with probably Susan, you know, we're probably right in the middle. You know, she's either the 50th most liberal or I am. I don't know how it goes, but we're, you know, we're, we're pretty much in the middle. And, and one thing that you see in that is it presents you're all the 50th most yeah. liberal I think yeah well out of 100 <laughs> right so they, they rank you according to ideology and we're kind of right in the middle and and I think the the one thing that you will see um, when when you look at that is you will see a different range of problem solving in the middle and that is how do we now, now we're not going to get everything we want but how do we get something done and I think the one thing that I would tell you that women bring is they want to get something done. Mm -hmm. And they're willing to leave some of that ideology back in the corner to just move the ball forward. Or else, why are we doing this? And I think a lot of the women, when they run, because they just can't like swagger out there on a flight deck, right? A lot of when they run, they run on accomplishment. Because when I was running the first time, I remember looking at Janet Napolitano and Kathleen Sebelius' website, and they had their goals and how they met them. And so then I thought, okay, that's what I'm going to do when I'm county attorney. And I did the same thing. Um, I think someone once said that women candidates, I don't agree with the whole thing, speak softly and carry a big statistic. <laughs> um, and I, I think that gets to your idea, Heidi, that people are trying, that women tend to run more on accountability and getting things done. So candidly, I mean, have you found that your male colleagues, how have they gone with the flow? Is this generational to some degree? Um, do you feel, sometimes I'm sure it's hard to discern how someone's reacting to you based on your party versus your gender. You know, there are different complicating factors. But, and you're often kind of stuck in both positions, Senator Collins. I mean, how do you find the men have received this slight increase in women in this dynamic that you've described? Well, um, in my party, in the leadership ranks, we still have a lot of work to do. And um, <laughs> but uh, I do think the increased number of women uh, does make the Senate a better place. We just swore uh, in last week the first woman senator from Mississippi. And that's increased the number of women in the Senate to a record 23. I, I do think it is generational to some extent. And I also think it reflects society at large. As we see more women in higher positions in the corporate world as CEOs, that influences people's perceptions of the role of women in general. But I'll tell one quick story, which also suggests that maybe it's generational. As you know, we do have these women senator dinners about once uh, every five or six weeks, and we take turns sponsoring them. And they're really a great way for us to build those bonds of trust. We don't solve the world's problems over these dinners, but we do get to know each other. And that makes it easier for us to work together. Well, one day I was riding on the subway over for a vote, and an older male senator who's since retired said to me, I hear you women got together again last <laughs> night. <laughs> and I said, yes, we did. And he said, well, what do you talk about? <laughs> and I said, we were planning the coup. <laughs> and, 
And he, he very nervously laughed because he wasn't sure whether I meant it <laughs> or whether I was trying to be funny. And I just left him in that state of not knowing for sure. So I do think it is a generational. I think it reflects changes in society at large. But also, when I first came to the Senate, and there were only nine women, uh, which was a record number at that time, there were not a sufficient number of women so that there was a woman on each committee. Mm -hmm. And now there is. Mm -hmm. And that makes a difference, not because we think alike, and I always push back against that, mm -hmm. but women do bring different perspectives and different life experiences, and that matters. Do you find that's true in the Democratic caucus, too? Because, you know, obviously, um, Harry Reid always made a big deal about the number of women on that side of the aisle. Um, but when men there are, uh, see themselves losing some power in committee when it's a woman who takes the chair, I mean, do you think that there's any feeling of threat uh, on that side of the aisle with, with the women? Well, I, I, for me, it's, it's strange because um, I think that my struggle frequently in um, the Democratic caucus is more where I come from. You know, I'm, I, I, I'm a senator in a state, uh, the president won by 36 points. So um, my perspective um, from the middle of the country is completely different than the perspective you might have on either one of the coasts. And so I, I find myself not kind of reacting to what's happening in the caucus based on gender roles, but based on inclusivity of different ideas and different thought. And so that's been more my challenge, which is to stand up and say, hey, guess what? You know, you guys want to stop natural gas from getting exported out of this country. You don't own that natural gas. And that's a good thing for our trading partners. That's, a, you know, bringing that perspective, that, that perspective that is different than maybe what they, what, what would always be the dialogue within the Democratic caucus. And I think that I've been very successful in getting things done by being able to be in that chair and present a different idea where we can all do win-wins. So my, I would say it's not so much gender for me as what it is, kind of that ideological spectrum. I think sometimes you don't know if that's what it is. Um, they have these gangs sometimes, and I remember when they had the gang on immigration reform, and I'm on Judiciary Committee, and I really want to be on it because I'd worked on the first one, and they said, well, we have eight, eight people. They're all guys, but if you find one more Republican, then you can go on it. And I never did, and so I didn't get to be in the gang. Um, <laughs> And so, and then, so sometimes at meetings, you have the traditional things that happen where a woman says something in the Senate, this happens, and then the man says the same thing 15 minutes yeah. later. They go, that's such a there great is, idea. Yeah. Oh, yeah, but, yeah. Oh, that's so, so oh, smart. Good. Good. And I've that's seen true. more and more that the women senators will say, well, uh, you know, Heidi Amy said just that. said that. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. I, when, so, when everybody goes, yeah, yeah, that's a really good idea. I said, Amy said it 10 minutes ago. <laughs> it's true. It was a good idea. Now it was a good idea 10 minutes ago. <laughs> so. I, so I think that more and more that stuff is happening. It's certainly happening with policy. Um, the, remember that the finance committee meeting on health care where one of the male senators said, well, I don't know why we'd have maternity benefits and as mandatory because, like, I never would use them. And <laughs> without missing a beat, Debbie Stabenow says, I bet your mother did. Yeah. Um, and so I think that we are, we are calling it for what it is when at these public issue moments. I think when there's those moments when um, someone's not getting credit for something, we all try to help each other. But I still think that it goes on that you get excluded in some way. That you, and you never know if it's just because it's me or is it because I'm a woman and they're just having fun because they're all guys. And it's really hard to identify. And I don't think that's just in the Senate. I think that happens in every workplace in America. I was going to say that man thing we're repeating that just never happens in journalism. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk about something that might sound a little superficial, but I don't think it is in, in a sense about the physical aspects of being in the Senate and and just when gender makes a stamp on the workplace. Now, when you all got there, was there only probably Senator Highcamp? This was changed by the time you came. I'm not sure, but there was at one point only a men's senator's gym. Isn't that correct? Very recently. But talk a little bit about that and sort of just the, the facilities and that whole story. 
<laughs> you want to talk about the bathroom? Go ahead, Senator Clementine. <laughs> I'll do the bathroom. You do you the can bathroom. Do the gym. Gym. <laughs> <laughs> we got bathrooms, and we got locker rooms, and we got <laughs> actual gyms. Go. Uh, well, the, the bathroom story is that the there was, uh, for a long time, there was no women's center's bathroom, and so, and we all have votes at the same time. And when Barbara Mikulski was there, they finally got one. Okay, then it was really small. And at, when the whole new crop came in, I sent out this tweet that went viral that said, for the first time in the history of the United States of America, there is a traffic jam in the women's senator's bathroom. <laughs> then we decided to use that to try to expand the bathroom. Um, and so uh, uh, Barbara Mikulski and I self-appointed ourselves to the Expand the Women's Bathroom Committee. <laughs> we met with the architect of the Capitol, and there's all these historic things going on, and he presented us with a plan to add one stall. <laughs> and she looked at me, she goes, what does this look like to you? And I said, well, this looks like to me like it's a bathroom plan for 20 women senators, not for what we will have one day, 50 or 100. And she <laughs> takes the plan, she shoves it back to him and says, you know what this is? This is a glass ceiling bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> and needless to say, we got the extra stall. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the gym story. So, when I was first elected uh, to the Senate in 1996, there was only a gym for the male senators. There was no gym for the women at all. So, finally, uh, Kay Bailey Hutchinson from Texas and the rest of us that lobbied for a, a gym for the women. And there we got this little closet that had two treadmills in it. And I'm not exaggerating. Meanwhile, the male gym has a pool, a, a tendons, <laughs> small trainers, pool, but. a small pool. I'll get to the pool. <laughs> and, and all sorts of weights and equipment, et cetera. Well, then fast forward many years. And there's now a small women's gym, but it does not have a pool. And uh, when one of our colleagues, Kay Hagan, was uh, elected, she was a real swimmer. She said, well, I want to use that pool. And there's a sign on the door that says men only. Mm -hmm. And it, we just can't believe this in this day and age. It's well, 2008. <laughs> It turns out that there was another reason why it was not co-ed. <laughs> and that is, uh, and I will not name the senators, no, no. but uh, there were at least two male senators who enjoyed, four. <laughs> there were four, uh, who enjoyed swimming in the nude. Yeah. The, now, this is something you could probably only learn about at a New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so uh, fast forward today, it is co-ed, and it says proper attire Higher required. <laughs> yeah. And the best part of that story is when Kay Hagan lost her race, we had the women senators, we had a party for her, and At we had pool. a goodbye party <laughs> by the pool. <laughs> Um, going back to uh, your state, Center High Campus, you mentioned uh, Donald Trump was, you know, a little more successful there than his opponent, um, and you're up for re-election, mm -hmm. and we are seeing a lot of women really engaged in politics in a huge way this year, both in the numbers of those are running, but we get that sense with the voters, too. Do you anticipate that you will try to leverage that in your race, engage female voters? I think what Amy talked about, which is how you know, I've been at this. This is my seventh statewide race. I started in 1984, the first year of the woman. When I was 28 years old, I ran for statewide office. And so I served as attorney general. I served as tax commissioner and lost a race for governor, which I want to just point out many, many senators, women senators have run and lost governor's races. It is easier to get elected, in my opinion, to the United States Senate than it is to get elected the chief executive of your state. And so the, just, uh, the, the statistics would bear that out. But, but when, when I look at it, I'm all about, this is what I intended to do, this is what I got done, this is, this is what I hope you will let me continue to do. 
And so I don't think that message is gender. I don't think it's anything other than saying, look, you may not have always agreed with me, but I have fought very hard for the interest of my state. The, the difference, I think, for me, when you look at kind of the ec economic issues, you know, everybody in the Senate works on the economic issues for their state. But when you look at those kinds of what are families really struggling with, whether it's retirement security, whether it's student debt, whether it is a child who is challenged either with addiction or mental health challenges, a child who is challenged in school, usually you will see a woman behind those issues. And so I think what, what, what I bring is not only you know, great work that we've done on the economic issues, but issues that involve how people live their lives and how we can make that easier. Now, in the past, those were called women's issues. And we really avoid that, that line anymore. These are issues of family. These are economic issues. Barbara Mikulski always said it best. She said, yes, we women, we understand the macro issues. We get the macroeconomic issues. But she said, we understand the macaroni and cheese issues. And <laughs> you think about that. And so I think that, that if you're, if you're going to look and say, well, you know, you're, you're going to mobilize women. I, I mean, what I like to think is that the issues that I've taken on on childhood trauma, taking on murdered and missing indigenous uh, women, Correct. all of those issues um, are relatable to everyone, but maybe more relatable to the women in my state. So um, since Senator Ernst isn't here, uh, Senator Collins, I'll let you speak for your entire party. Because <laughs> that, right. that usually works well for you. Um, so um, we wish. <laughs> no, yeah. we're, we're for that. Yeah. Um, Good. Great. <laughs> obviously, um, there are more uh, Democratic women in the Senate and Congress generally. They tend to be, you know, Republican women have a harder time, uh, or there's certainly fewer of them in most uh, in legislative bodies. Um, and, at this, and so I'm kind of curious, do you find it more difficult, um, both campaigning out there in the world as a senator, to be a woman in the Republican Party or to be a Republican talk, sometimes talking to women? Hmm. I don't in my state. Um, my state is, has, as I said, a long tradition of electing women to the Senate, and all three of those women have been Republican. Mm -hmm. So I certainly don't feel that at all in my state. I sometimes feel it when I'm, if I'm giving a speech in another state um, where there'll be assumptions made about my views that aren't necessarily correct, but I really have never felt that in my state. Um, Ta let's, given that uh, President Trump has been um, accused of and, and himself admitted to uh, various improper acts um, and perhaps worse um, against women, to what extent do all of you feel compelled as women to represent this as a woman's concern? Uh, to what extent do you reject that idea? You know, men aren't supposed to have some special honor, show some special fidelity to their gender in the context of politics. So. How, what are your thoughts about that, generally as women, particularly in the Trump era? Well, I think that, first of all, you can see moments where the women senators have come together for some really important issues. Uh, as we've said, we don't agree on everything, but like domestic violence, the Stronger Violence Against Women Act, there was a weaker one that was going through, and every woman senator, and the Republicans at our side, said we're not taking that weaker bill. And when we do that and take that kind of position, it matters. Uh, just two weeks ago, on the ranking on the Rules Committee, and we did a letter about updating the sexual harassment policy in the Senate, which I think we're very close to doing. And Senator Blunt and I have been working with um, Senator McConnell and Senator Schumer on this. But it had been stalled out after the budget vote, and we got all 22, now we're at 23, but all 22 women senators on a letter to the two leaders saying this is not tolerable. We need to update uh, this policy of sexual harassment. So I do think there are moments that we all come together across party lines on some important issues. But I have always believed that my obligation is for my state. And the way I see probably the most important thing uh, that I can do for women in politics right now outside of things that I think affect both men and women, economy, all those issues. Um, is try to get more women to run. 
And what I see we're seeing right now from that day two after the inauguration uh, is just this incredible outpouring of women candidates. I was just down in North Carolina last night for a, a dinner, um, a tribute actually for Kay Hagan and spoke there. And they have people running in all of their 170 state legislative di districts with an all time high in terms of the number of women. Uh, you look at in New Jersey uh, where one of their uh, elected representatives in this last round, the day of the Women's March, said, well, I just hope they're going to be home in time to make dinner. That guy got beaten by a woman in this last election. <laughs> and so we are, we literally are up to, on day two after the inauguration, 6,000 women signed up to run for office, and now it's up to 30,000 women. Uh -huh. And I don't think when you see those districts that they won in Wisconsin and in Virginia on the state legislative um, arena, I don't, I don't think they're all running on, on uh, set women's issues. They're running on their Model. desire for change. They're running on the economy. They're running, as she just said, on potholes and yeah. infrastructure and things like that. But they are a different face for America, and it's a face that we need. The, the, the one thing I would say is I think often about whose shoulders I stand on. You know, whether it was the suffragettes, you know, whether it was, you know, Jane Addams to begin with and the suffragettes and, and who's that next generation. And I think, how am I making it easier for the next generation? What, what role do I play? And so when you say, do we, do we have a higher obligation? I think the answer is yes until we have the equal, true equal opportunity, equal pay, equal understanding of family responsibilities. That's why I sponsored the Family Act. But, but we all stand on someone's shoulders and we all have an obligation to make the world a better place, um, to make the world a more just and fairer place. And that's a role every elected official should feel strongly, to preserve the democracy and make the world a more just, safe, and equitable place. And we have to find those injustices and take responsibility for fixing them. And I want to give you a very specific example of that, uh, which involved bipartisan cooperation. Diane Feinstein, Democrat from California, and I joined forces to respond to the appalling sexual abuse of young gymnasts by Dr. Larry Nasser. This was an example where there were so many red flags and where so many of these young girls spoke out, complained, asked about what was going on, but they were separated from their parents, their support structure in these gymnastic camps. And, you know, they're 14. They're, they're young teenagers in a lot of cases. And Diane and I talked with these young women who are older now and thus more confident about speaking out about their experiences. And we put together a bill that has now become law that requires these amateur athletic groups uh, and the Olympic Committee to report immediately to the police, to law enforcement, any allegations of sexual abuse. And the number of victims that this man had was, is just so appalling. And that's a very concrete example of where the bill, the bill has other provisions in it as well, but I think that mandatory reporting is going to make a real difference. And the courage of these young women coming forward now and telling what happened to them is going to make a real difference. And he's going to be in jail for a very long time, mm -hmm. I hope the rest of his life. Well, but taking it back in, into politics, and we've seen this whole Me Too movement, obviously, in politics. I mean, Senator Klobuchar, many Democrats actually faced a lot of criticism, saying that um, Senator Al Franken, who was from your state, obviously, was driven out without enough due process. What's your observation about that, that period? Well, Al is a good friend. I actually was just um, talking to him this weekend. Um, and um, I was in a unique place. He was my colleague. 
Um, I personally did not call on him publicly to resign, uh, which has been out there publicly, and some of my colleagues felt differently. Um, I think he made that decision on his own based on his view, and you can read his speech that while his work will live on, that he felt he couldn't be effective uh, because of what had happened. Um, but at the same time, I think that as we are dealing with these, a change in the workplace, which is really important, and it can't just be about famous people being toppled down. It also has to be about a safer workplace uh, and a decent workplace for everyone from the factory line worker uh, to the nurse in the hospital. We at the same time have to make sure that there's due process and we have to uh, make sure there's gradiated sanctions. Not everything is the same um, for a kind of conduct, um, which is um, I think you've seen, so maybe someone gets suspended from their workplace, maybe someone gets written up. That's what happens in normal workplaces, and I think it gets hard when it gets uh, translated into a public persona and a public arena. And as I've always told Al, uh, he's had two acts and he's still going to have a third one. Um, and uh, what he did was wrong, and he has said that. Um, but. I think a lot of these people who have done egregious things um, beyond the pale, I think you won't see them again. I think there's other people that will somehow atone for their sins, and we may not see them in, their, in politics again, but they'll find another place uh, to be effective and to make a difference. And going back to, um, again, gender and electoral politics, what do you all think, did we, the grand we minimize or maximize the uh, role of gender in uh, Hillary Clinton's defeat? That's a really interesting question. <laughs> That's um, never good. <laughs> it, it really is. Um, I, I've given a lot of thought to that question of whether or not uh, Hillary, whom I served with, uh, gender, gender <laughs> held her back. Hey, you're off the hook. That's about really Joni Ernst. Senator Joni Ernst from Iowa, everybody. This is a brave woman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How many times was your plane de-iced today, Senator Ernst? Um, well, just once, but we were stuck in a snowbank. They had to call out the <laughs> super tug to get us out. So this is a woman dedicated to a lot of people. Thank you so much for Thank joining. Thank you. I apologize. We were just talking about um, what role uh, gender played in Hillary Clinton's defeat. Do we think that was overstated? Do we think that was understated? <laughs> you came in a great moment. <laughs> Wow, let's start from the beginning. <laughs> I'm going to yield. <laughs> Susan. Uh, I, I think, Joni, were you the first woman elected to I, Congress ever from Iowa? Yes, right. that's correct. I was correct. the first woman yes. elected ever from North Dakota. There you go. Yes. Exactly. And I covered a, a little bit of your campaign at the end. I remember it was the most delicious bacon I ever had in my life. It is your, that final it stop is that day was just <laughs> such a good moment in campaign <laughs> coverage. Um, I don't remember you running on that at all. Uh, and I didn't cover every second of that campaign, but that wasn't part of your platform. Uh, no, no. Truly, at, at the time I was running, too, we had seen the advent of ISIS. And with my background, having served in Iraq, um, it really was on everybody's mind. So I think it was more the, the quality and the type of candidate that Iowa wanted to see at that time rather than gender-based. Um, and Senator Klobuchar, I still, you want to take that Hillary Clinton question? Okay. Or? <laughs> All right, okay. See how I uh, dodged it? I mean, I think there is so much going on when you analyze uh, that race, but they're clearly, I haven't read Jen Palomero's book yet. I think that'll be interesting to look at because there were gender issues uh, in that campaign with how people looked at her. I saw the Twitter feed. I saw what people were saying about her. But I think we also know there were other issues, um, like the way that Donald Trump was able to dominate um, the news, and I'm not criticizing the news, it just happened. People were, he would bring up something or something would be brought up about him and everyone would go down the rabbit hole with him, uh, which is something that I argue on our side that we have to keep our focus on a optimistic, positive agenda, economic agenda for this country, and that at the same time, uh, we have to be an emergency break and stand up for our democracy. Um, and so when I look back and translate that to the campaign, 
um, it was very hard for her to keep on that message. And I'd say the second thing, which she has talked about, is just that certain parts of the country and certain areas in the rural parts of the country um, felt left behind in the campaign. And uh, they didn't feel like uh, there was uh, enough focus for them. I always remind myself of the story of my husband. He was the third of, is the third of six boys. and. He was always a good boy, and he got left behind at the gas station several times when they would go on <laughs> in the station wagon. They would forget about him. Um, and I think that was part of the problem that we're not going to let happen again in uh, the future because we know our states is we're not going to let the Midwest get left at the gas station. So there was, um, I think those kinds of things played a factor, but I'm not going to say that gender didn't play a factor because I just it's very hard to measure uh, what happened. Um, and she had a lot of good policies to run on. She was focused a lot on running on um, uh, being a woman, I think. And I think the story that we've told up here, and it's hard to translate it on the national basis because we've never had a woman president, is most of us um, didn't run that way. We were proud to be a women candidate. We were proud to have a lot of women support. But we didn't run with that as our theme. Um, and Senator, we were talking before about the female senator dinners, um, those that are I guess Barbara McCoskey started that, correct? Um, and so do you remember the first one that you attended when you came I to do. the Senate and what that was like? Had you, had you been, you'd been in politics obviously in Iowa. Was there something analogous in your state or was that special in any way? What was that like? Well, it, it was special um, because we all came together and we talked about some of those common issues. I believe uh, the kidnappings that Boko Haram had done was really in the news. And so that was an issue that we focused on at, at that supper. And I thought that was really important that we could come together. Um, it started in a very lighthearted measure, but then move into some really heavy policy and, and how we involve our, ourselves in, in foreign affairs. But um, back in, in Iowa, pretty much everybody hangs out with everybody, um, Republican or Democrat. Y'all work on the, the floor of the state Senate. You have your own little desk right there. You don't have offices anywhere. It's your, everybody sees what you're doing. Um, and you're all working together. Uh, I feel that way sometimes with the women senators when we come together, we're, we're all working together. We may not agree all the time, but we're working together on certain issues that we really have strong passions for. So I appreciate the, I appreciate the times that we're able to get together and do that. I, I, I just want to point out, I hosted the most fun. <laughs> <laughs> I took all the women bowling. Oh, that was <laughs> the White House. Oh, but you didn't and say bought them house. bowling shirts. And where did we go bowling? At the White House. Yes, yeah, so we, we did. And we got in big trouble because we stood on the lanes and they had to resand oh, yeah. the lanes yeah. afterwards. Yeah. But there's a very <laughs> famous and very fun picture of all of us. Yeah, bowling. with some really funny names of our bowling. Yeah. Yeah. I can see why the men are jealous of what you guys do. You guys have, do have the most fun. Um, speaking of your male Senate colleagues again, um, tell, me some, tell me some uplifting stories about uh, your, your most feminist, if you will, or your most female supporting colleagues. I mean, we have this sense that you guys are you know, toiling over there in the minority, but obviously there are many men who are very supportive of uh, women's centers. Do you have any specific people or anecdotes that come to mind? I remember being in Asia and having Senator McCain with Senator McCain and Lindsey Graham and uh, the Asian leaders and we were in China, we were in Japan, we were in Vietnam. Um, Senator McCain would go first, he was the head of the delegation but I was the lead Democrat. This is right after he lost the presidential race. And he was just, I, I remember thinking resilient, you know, he just loved still going out and doing this. They'd go to look at him and then they'd look at Lindsey. And every single time John would go, excuse me, Senator Klobuchar goes next. She is the lead Democrat on this trip. Um, <laughs> and he did those kinds of things all the time um, for a number of women. And I, I think you look for your friends in unexpected places. Um, and he just had that sense of honor. Um, and in every male room that we were in, he would be sure that I got treated with respect. Mm -hmm. Mine was going to be a Senator McCain story also. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, traveled with John McCain to Iraq and Afghanistan on four different occasions. And the first trip to Afghanistan was very early on. And I remember 
um, it, how he made sure I was the only woman on the trip and the security guards were all male also. And he just always made sure that I was as involved as everyone else. And, uh, and that was really important to me mm -hmm. as well. He was always very good about that. Uh, the other story I will tell is also a military trip, and it was with my friend Jack Reed from Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. And it was in Iraq, and it was extremely hot. And we were in a helicopter, and they decided that they would leave the doors open on both sides. And I was in the seat right next to the open window and or open door. And I was absolutely terrified that I was going to be sucked out <laughs> of the helicopter. And uh, this would not have phased Joni at all. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> She's laughing at you a little I, bit. I now. know, <laughs> and you're allowed to. And uh, and everybody else in the helicopters is, you know, fine with this. And Jack Creed reaches over and he pats me on the arm and he says, "There, there, it's going to be all right," <laughs> because apparently I had a look. I didn't say anything, <laughs> but I had a look of sheer terror on my face. And when we landed on this gravel runway, all the rocks came in, <laughs> and my entire arm was bruised with, from all the stones hitting me. Uh, on the way back, we shut the doors. <laughs> but seriously, it was just, uh, I remember that just because it was a very human, mm -hmm. reassuring, nice gesture from my friend Jack Reed, who I think was a paratrooper. He, he graduated <laughs> yeah. from West Point. And uh, for him, this was nothing. But for me, it was a big deal. These women are working hard for all of you. These are your yes. tax dollars <laughs> work. And you can never show fear after no, all. Exactly. <laughs> I want to be able to um, take some questions soon from a few of you out here, as well as in our Facebook audience. Um, so you want to prepare some questions. We will have folks with microphones coming around. I just want to be super clear that questions end with a question mark. So this is not the time for your, uh, for any long statements um, or uh, to kind of complain about their vote on the farm bill, which I know is a big concern here in Manhattan, or, or just kind of stick to the, we are in New York. Stick to the <laughs> format here. It's not crossfire. Um, so let me just um, start off with Danny from Facebook who says, what advice do you have for young people who are not old enough to run yet, but want to in the future? Oh, can I take that Please one, do. Jennifer? Um, I visit with school students all the time. They're um, not even of voting age yet, but they are really interested in politics, and I always encourage them to get involved in their local communities. Just start there, simple volunteerism. Um, find your passion and, and pour yourself into that, and that really gives you a foothold. It gets you experience, and it gets you well on your way. And then once uh, they are out of school looking for opportunities, whether uh, they are interested in running for elected office, city council, state government, whatever it might be, but it always starts with some level of volunteerism or being involved with school government and so forth, and it's just a, a great way to meet people, too. Um, do we have some questions out here ready for the audience? Back here? Hi, my name is Alice Gomston. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm so stricken by your enthusiasm and your passion for seeing more women join the Senate. By the same token, we're seeing the Me Too movement has been led by women. If we ever got to the point where we had a female majority in the Senate, mm -hmm. do you feel, if that would had happened today, do you feel that the president would still be in office? That's a good question. <laughs> Their questions are so much harder than me. <laughs> I, I, I would I'll, say I'll, we need more I'll, women. I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> okay. I don't think, I don't think who sits in those chairs right. should matter whether the president's still in office or not. That's we have a process. The process um, will, will, will hopefully finish. And I think one thing that you see almost unanimous, whether we 
we believe that, th that there wouldn't be a firing or we would react appropriately to a firing. You know, we'll see how the investigation goes. We'll see what happens um, in the House. That's where th any kind of proceeding would, would initiate. And so I don't think this is about gender. This is about the democracy and fulfilling obligations for democratic values and fulfilling the process. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Hi, I was just wondering if you could comment on Tammy Duckworth, sorry, I'm right here. Um, uh -oh. Tammy Duckworth's yeah, efforts yeah, yeah. to change some of the policies or r the rules I'll and um, if you think she'll be successful or if there's any other rules that you think also need changing. Oh, yeah. Tammy Duckworth is a senator answer. from uh, Illinois, just letting people know, who just had a baby, correct? Yeah, I'd yes. like to mm -hmm. say she's the first woman that had a baby in the Senate, but not like in the Senate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she is the first woman uh, senator uh, that had a baby while being a senator, and it's pretty exciting. And um, she is an incredible person, as you know, having uh, served uh, like uh, Joni lost both her legs uh, somehow at over the age of 50, uh, is having her second child now. Um, and so the issue is that Tammy, uh, to her credit, has pushed this issue because we have these late night votes and things like that um, about, well, what are you going to do when you have to vote at 1 a.m.? And what if she has the baby? What if her husband's not there? What if this is that? Um, and so again, I'm the ranking on rules. And so um, she is putting forth an effort and I feel very strongly having worked with Roy uh, that we're gonna get this done. Uh, maybe, um, I don't wanna give it away, maybe like maybe in a week um, <laughs> uh, to um, allow the baby on the floor. And my husband does joke, well, what do you mean? There's a lot of babies on the floor already. <laughs> 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 but uh, the truth is uh, that I think we're going to get this done and it'll be a groundbreaking thing. It'll have Tammy's name on it. And so we're looking at getting it done very quickly in the next week so that the next thing, time she comes, if she wants to bring that baby on the floor and if future men or women senators want to bring a young child on the floor, uh, they're going to be able to do that. So, so yeah. Hello there, my name is Gene Seidman, and uh, my question uh, concerns the nuclear arms budget of $85 billion a year in the US, and that money could be used for reallocating towards infrastructure, healthcare, education. And I'm wondering, how do you f actually uh, reallocate those funds? I mean, if you want some to be used for the military, I get it, but how do you physically, what is the process for reallocating some of those funds that are currently, you know, we could actually pay for all those things that we're talking about? Well, okay. I, there is a, a process uh, through the Senate. Uh, the, the president has a budgeting process and then the Senate and House have a separate budgeting process. And it would just be up to the, the leadership through the appropriations on where those dollars would be allocated. Um, I would say that it is important though that with um, the nuclear posture review that was just done, to maintain our safety net out there. It is important, a lot of those dollars go towards making sure that the armaments that are out there, and if you're talking specifically about armed services, making sure that they are safely stored and that uh, any that are outdated are safely retired. So that does take a lot of dollars um, for upkeep, but uh, truly it's, it's uh, a leadership decision on how those dollars are allocated between the different types of agencies that exist in the federal government. Yeah, and coming from a state where obviously um, at one point if we left the union we'd be the third largest nuclear power in the world. Um, I can tell you we are in desperate need of modernization. Um, if we are going to have a deterrent uh, uh, effect that it needs to work and it needs to be modernized and so I think take a look at what percentage investment in that modernization compared to the overall budget, and I think that might tell you that um, uh, there is a there's a value still in that level of deterrence. And it may not be something shared here, but I can tell you I've seen the need, the critical need for modernization of what we currently have, so that it actually is a deterrent. Mm -hmm. Right here. Mm -hmm. Hi, thanks so much for being here today. Um, my question is, 
is that um, we've talked a lot about gender here today. And we're finding, and you're hearing more and more in the news, that gender is becoming more fluid, <coughs> at least to some of us. And I'm wondering about the particular ad administration right now and how they're taking the LGBTQ issues and kind of going backwards instead of forwards in that, um, for example, women have felt discriminated against. And so now we're talking another discrimination against another group of people. So I'm wondering, and it's kind of a facetious question, no one in the Republican Party has LGBTQ people in their families? I mean, I don't understand the discrimination that is starting to um, happen in, in the rhetoric recently. I'd like to respond to that. I was the lead Republican in repealing the very discriminatory don't ask, don't tell law. And I have always felt that if you're willing to put on the uniform of the, your country, our country, lay your life potentially on the line, uh, that we should accept anyone who is qualified and not be concerned about sexual orientation. And it, we got all these predictions that repealing Don't Ask, Don't Tell was going to be a disaster, that it would undermine unit cohesiveness, and that hasn't happened. And so I, um, I am concerned about the administration's latest moves on transgender, uh, troops who are already serving. There's some 9,000 is the estimate. Um, and as long as they're qualified and doing their job, we should be grateful to people for being willing to serve their country, not concerned about their sexual orientation. And I will address that as well. Tammy Duckworth and I were just featured in an ad that was done by an outside group because we do support transgenders in the military. Um, and I have served. I've served in uh, combat theater, uh, 2003 to 2004. And I have said, transgenders ask me, transgender people ask me, you know, well, what do you think about this issue? And I tell them, if you meet the, you have to meet qualifications. I had to meet qualifications. Anybody that meets those qualifications to serve in the military, if you are willing to lay down your life beside mine, I want you in my military. Well, one, one of the challenges, I just want to comment on this because it's harder than what it should be. We, we've um, debated and, and actually came close to passing a bill that would prohibit discrimination in any form. Susan and I have worked on a reauthorization of runaway and homeless youth. We can't get it across the finish line because we have a direct statement against non-discrimination. We need to debate a non-discrimination policy in this country in a big way so we don't have these one-off discussions about this or that. We have a discussion about Americans deserving to not be discriminated against. Um, unfortunately... I just want to point out... Oh, these, I'm sorry. These are courageous Republicans on this issue, but this is not, as you point out, what the president has said. And uh, this is not just about transgender troops. Uh, it's the rhetoric that we hear about immigrants. It's the rhetoric we hear about refugees. And that gets to my point uh, that I believe that the Senate, Democrats and Republicans, have got to speak out uh, at any moment, at any time, to be an emergency break on this administration. Um, unfortunately, we um, have run out the clock. I want to uh, thank all these senators. They've come through weather. They've come across their states. They've come from their Sunday shows. They've done it all just to be here with us. And we're so grateful and lucky to have had you. And thank you all very much for coming. You're a great audience. Good job, Amy.